whatever help we can get, we would very much appreciate. And um, this moving forward, we hope we can serve as a resource to the board, however possible, um, our members included, because they are, um, they do represent the vast majority of Californians in the state and want to uh, keep conserving. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christina Donnelly, followed by Gregory Weber from the California Urban Water Conservation Council. Hi. Uh, Chair Marcus, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to comment today. I'm Christina Donnelly from the Pacific Institute. I'm a research associate. We're a nonprofit research uh, institute based out of Oakland, California. Um, I am here to express our strong support for the state board's reporting requirements, uh, including monthly reporting on water production, residential per capita water use, excuse me, and most recently, uh, local compliance and enforcement actions. These data are essential for improving our understanding about how and why water use varies across the state. These data can also help educate and inform the media, the general public, and decision makers about the many factors affect affecting water use. This could be an important turning point in general understanding about California water, but we need to be careful with how we talk about these data. The month-to-month -month comparisons do not represent water savings. Rather, they reflect short-term conservation, long-term efficiency improvements, and changes in weather and the economy. It is preferable to talk about them more simply as reductions in water use and then explain these factors. But preparing for drought, climate change, and ongoing water scarcity concerns requires immediate action as well as a long-term sustained effort, and I'm pleased to hear that that's on the table today. Um, while the emergency regulations are one element of the state's drought response, we also need to pursue deeper permanent reforms in water use and management across California. And thank you for your work on this effort. Thank you, thanks for yours. Mr. Weber, followed by Jack Hawks from the California Water Association. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. I'm Greg Weber with the California Urban Water Conservation Council. I wanna talk with you about two related concepts or topics, messaging and metrics. I submitted a letter yesterday uh, after the deadline for comments on the emergency regs um, had passed, but my letter's still timely, and I'll make sure that the clerk has a copy, because it doesn't really go to the text of the proposed regs or whether to support them or not, but really uh, an opportunity to sort of step back, because I'm very mindful of the governor's call now, um, quite a while ago, for uh, Californians to embrace conservation as a way of life. And now that we're in the fourth year of the drought here, I think it becomes very clear clear that um, the way of life is, is now and is not sometime in the future. Um, and so with that in mind, I think we can agree that messaging is going to be one of the most important parts or is one of the most important parts of changing people's water use behavior. I think we can also agree that messaging needs to be simple, clear, and consistent. So for example, the fact that you have now set up last summer and now have extended the emergency emergency regs, I send, think that sends a powerful message to Californians, regardless of the specific uh, amount of water that's saved by these regulations. So to that extent, it's a powerful message that, um, that I can certainly support. One area where the messaging isn't working as well as I'd like to see it work is with the monthly press releases and staff presentations that use the year-over-year -year comparisons. On the one hand, some months, it makes it look like Californians are doing a tremendous job. And just the very next month, it looks like there's tremendous backsliding. And clearly, without normalized data and a broader baseline, these sort of year-over-year -year comparisons can really send uh, conflicting and confusing messages to folks. Your website includes some very nice caveats about how not to use these data, th this data to compare different agencies. Um, I do still get calls pretty much every month after the, the press release comes out uh, and, and asking me to explain why is California doing such a great or such a poor job. So I would simply ask that, that there could be some sort of simple caveats included with the, uh, the press releases and, and also the staff presentations. They are the most downloaded and, and visible um, uh, uh, documents from your effort here. Um, more importantly, I think the question that the, the monthly press releases raise, raise for me is the question of overall metrics for state 
wide efficiency. There are multiple flavors of GPCD. The council has one. DWR, I've lost track at how many they have. You now have one. So it, uh, some of the policy wonks perhaps um, actually can, can tell them apart. I'm not sure I can. But um, the general public probably can't. And you know, I don't know if GPCD is the best metric to use. It's what we've got now. But I think there's a great opportunity here to, again, start looking beyond the current crisis, look to conservation as a way of life, look beyond 20 by 2020, and try to um, reach some agreement on what a appropriate metrics are for urban water efficiency. Then we can set targets, then we can measure our progress. Um, I understand your, your staff is uh, going to be participating in the Urban Stakeholder Committee, DWR, and, and uh, the council will be there. That seems like a great place to talk about metrics, and so I'm looking forward to having that conversation with your staff. Thank That's you great. very much. We did direct it. Um, board member, Vice Chair Spivey Weber's suggestion to have that conversation because there were so many. We needed to create the RGPCD so that people had apples to kind of apples um, comparisons because if you include um, commercial and industrial, the GPCD number makes sense to wonks but not to a regular person. And so um, we added one, but we know there's a need to be working particularly for the long term with our colleagues at DWR and review. Thank you very much. Jack Hawks, followed by Sarah Amazade from the Coast Keep. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, board members, thank you very much. My name is Jack Hawks, Executive Director, California Water Association. Uh, my members are the uh, PUC regulated water utilities. I'm going to go very quickly until I can get to my main point. Uh, the uh, uh, water, regulated water utilities want to express their support not only for the extension but also for the additional prohibitions. We had some quibbles that we put in our letter, but those thoughts are actually for the next iteration as the noose tightens as this year goes on. And, and we may not wait 270 days for the next, uh, next time we're here. Uh, we'll have some more comments then. But what I want to get to is a specific uh, outreach, customer and media outreach issue, and that is this. We have one request of the board, and that's to assist the water agencies and water utilities with their media and customer outreach by addressing actually your number 10, be it resolved point in the resolution, uh, which states water suppliers that face higher budget shortfalls due to reduced sales should take immediate steps to raise rev necessary revenues in a way that actively promotes continued conservation. And well, guess what? Virtually every water utility and agency in the state's doing that right now. And unfortunately, they're getting taken to task uh, by the media for it. Uh, just last, a week ago today, the Chronicle had this editorial, San Francisco Chronicle had this editorial, taking, uh, th crit un criticizing three Bay Area water agencies for proposed rate increases to recover in a lost revenues. And uh, I'm not going to read, I don't have time to read the whole thing, but let me read one sentence in it. And that sentence is, customers and every water agency manager in the state has heard this statement a hundred times. Customers are essentially being punished with higher bills. Or by heating calls to conserve, customers are essentially being punished with higher bills. That's a hit that's unfair and should lead public officials to rethink their all too easy solutions. Well, guess what? If you actually conserve, you're not being hit with a higher bill. Yes, the rates can go up to recover those lost revenues, but that is not going to increase the bill. Rate increases do not necessarily translate to higher bills. So every one of these statements that appears throughout the state and all the newspapers is erroneous and it's, it's misleading the public. And that is, uh, that is something we all need to work on. And I think we need to tell the customers the truth. And the truth is that their bills won't necessarily go up if they're conserving and they won't go up if uh, their water agencies are factoring in their lower production costs in their, in their uh, rate adjustments. 
And, uh, and that message is not getting through, so I'm simply requesting that the Water Board assist us. And even tonight, all these TV cameras here on the evening news tonight, I'm pretty sure that uh, when they uh, review Max's presentation, the two m points that are gonna come out are that the customers are not conserving enough, uh, number one, and, uh, and number two, and they're not heeding uh, uh, these, these uh, prohibitions. And, and there are a lot of customers out there conserving, and we need to actually encourage this behavior and not uh, have them uh, uh, get the wrong impression, the wrong message from our uh, media efforts. Thank you. That, that's yeah. fair, uh, Mr. Hawks. I appreciate that, and mm -hmm. we're happy to figure out how to help with that. I worked on that with one of the districts that was taken to task last Friday with the media. As a matter of fact, it, in some cases, dealing with the drought does cost an agency more, but because people take their, because water agencies have done such a phenomenal job delivering mm -hmm. water, I mean, it's not true everywhere in the state, but in large urban areas, they've done such a great job, people are able to take it for granted, and they don't realize how much hard work goes into getting that water from a variety of sources, treating it to an incredibly high level of quality um, and distributing it. And in a drought, folks have to go buy water, they have to find other places, they have to treat water they might not have uh, looked right. at before they're going to different sources. So it costs more in a drought in many cases mm -hmm. to provide the same water. So if, if consumers conserve, they will pay less than they would otherwise, and the rate is just, uh, Percentage, You know, in the longer term, one of the things that we've had conversations with that aren't appropriate to do in an emergency regulation is that more districts should be moving to the kind of rate structure where they're working with their consumers, apropos of Mr. Boland's point, and working with them in public to figure out how to understand the water system and to see it as the service provision it is versus the provision of a commodity that you might just buy on the open market. That's, there's nothing that could be further from the truth with water. It is a very complex system and every region has its own uh, different set of water sources. But again, agencies have done such a good job that people take it for granted and so we can go, we see people going to that simplistic thing. Right. When I heard the messaging in the car that weekend that people were gonna pay higher rates because of conservation because they were conserving. I thought that is could not possibly be the message that those water agencies were trying to get out there. It just costs more to get water during a drought. And so by conserving, folks are actually saving against what would have happened otherwise. So it is a very tough message to get across because people do jump to the Higher conclusion. Bill, right. And it's disappointing that the editorial boards didn't ask some questions before writing those editorials. Right, a simple message takeaway. Higher rates don't necessarily mean higher bills. So, thanks. Hi, uh, the next speaker will be Kyle Jones from Sierra Club oh. after sir. <laughs> Good morning, board members, Chair Marcus. I'm Sarah Amanzada. I'm the Executive Director of California Coastkeeper Alliance. I represent 12 local waterkeeper organizations who work to promote sustainable water practices and water conservation throughout California in areas such as San Diego, Orange County, Los Angeles, and the Russian River Valley. I'm here today to register my strong support for your renewal and expansion of these regulations, most of which uh, require common sense water practices that many Californians and businesses have already adopted voluntarily, such as not watering one's lawn during or 48 hours after a rain event. Further, the additional reporting requirements for urban water suppliers on compliance and enforcement efforts are particularly enforcement. There has been some really good progress made, but enforcement has been lacking and uneven, and this is reflected of the fact that we are falling short of our 20% reduction target. And while we do support the regulations before you today, uh, I urge you to think about how we can move out of this emergency mode and looking at some of these temporary and incremental reforms and really start to think about uh, the sweeping permanent reforms that many water experts in the state are calling for. You know, there was some recent NASA data showing that we have just one year of water left in reservoirs if we continue with our current use. And you know, there's a real urgency and 
crisis around this drought. And I think we really need to see sort of the equal reaction from our decision makers, including the State Water Board, along these lines. I think the drought calls for a shared sacrifice, and that needs to be reflected in, in the regulations. I think there are several additional opportunities to save water that the board could address in permanent regulations and further incentivize local enforcement. Uh, the new requirement to report enforcement is a matter of basic fairness, and I think there are a lot of other data and information that we could be collecting um, to get even more information about our water use. Uh, data about demand broken down by class, so we know a lot more about not just residential use, but also commercial and industrial uses. Information on water agency spending on conservation and efficiency. Um, there have been some great efforts to date, but it would be helpful to see what percentage of the budgets are going towards conservation and efficiency. There are a whole suite of additional outdoor water use and landscaping requirements um, that have been detailed in several excellent reports, including the comprehensive report by Pacific Institute and NRDC. And finally, the ultimate incentive, pricing and rates. We need to send better price signals to high water users. And just one last point uh, before I conclude. A note about the, the conversation around shared sacrifice. You know, I do understand that there's some time and effort required to implement these regulations from golf courses, but it is concerning to me that the staff presentation has a bullet that says some communities may soon run out of water, and we're discussing, you know, what sort of landscapes are preferable from golf course users. So I encourage you here today and also the media covering this issue, let's really focus on the important issues. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Jones, followed by Kate Poole from NRDC. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. Um, Sierra Club California would like to show its strong support for these emergency measures. Uh, they expand upon last year's regulations and are common sense measures that we think will help everyone. Um, I'm particularly fond of the retail measures that I think will help increase uh, awareness among members of the public, especially with restaurants. And that, in turn, will drive uh, voluntary conservation measures in the home. We also welcome the greater reporting requirements than last year, uh, especially with regards to enforcement. Um, an article I saw this weekend came out from the Associated Press uh, going over enforcement measures, and some of it seemed very poor throughout the state. So I think it's, it's great to look forward and see where we can match enforcement to success and you know, push local agencies to do more. Um, we also would support uh, greater development of, or development of a hotline. Um, a lot of my members have uh, been frustrated with making calls to local agencies and that their complaints fall upon deaf ears. Mm. And I think this would also help to tie into where enforcement needs to occur uh, locally. Um, finally, I'd just like to conclude in that I hope that this is not a final step and that you know we look at where further mandatory restrictions need to happen throughout the year in the form of emergency regulations um, as the drought increases in severity, and also whether or not, uh, or not whether or not, but actually we need to begin shaping the con uh, conversation uh, around permanent measures that we can take. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Poole, followed by Connor Everts. Thank you, Chairwoman Marcus. Say, it, there really is a sea of green out there. It's funny. <laughs> it, sort of, it reminds me of elementary Except school or Max. something, <laughs> other than Max, who will protect with our lives. <laughs> yeah, your presentation was green, right? Sorry. Happy St. Patty's Day. Yeah. With the board's permission, um, I'd like to switch my speaking slot with Ms. Doden here, who has to dash out for a 1.30. Oh, okay, sure. Thanks so much to Kate, I really appreciate it. I'm Helen Roth Dowden speaking on behalf of Nexus Sea Water. And the rules that you implemented last year seem prepared and it seems you'll continue this year, focus on prohibitions of runoff and of outdoor watering. There seems to be a missed opportunity for promotion of policies that engage Californians in solving the water challenge by changing the ways we use water. Instead of using drinking water on our landscapes, we need to encourage homeowners to convert their irrigation systems to rely primarily on a source of water that is entirely within their own control. The reuse of water that has was first used in the homes for baths, showers, and laundry. <clears throat> so, you know, I really think that we're we're not really looking at some of the the most likely things that we could for this. 
The California Plumbing Code established rules for the reuse of water, actually it was 10 years ago, <clears throat> and now recently just uh, put in rules for untreated water under the plumbing codes. So we would encourage you to take a look at what we think are the fastest and cheapest way of doing this, which is to encourage <clears throat> on-site water reuse. Thank you. Great, thank you. I know you're, wor you're working with some pretty amazing systems that people can put in. It's kind of hard to do that in a temporary, our temporary rest. But, um, we're very supportive of moving that forward. Well, we, we'd like you to say something around encouraging that. Thanks. Thank you. Connor Everts, um, facilitator of the Environmental Water Caucus and executive director of the Southern California Watershed Alliance. And um, I'm a little colorblind, but I think there's green in my tie as well, so happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I wanted to first thank staff and the board for doing the ongoing reporting. Um, but what, to me it is really um, stated clearly, and having been a drought coordinator for municipal utilities and also as others in the room, convener of the California Urban Water Conservation Council, at this point, uh, we're failing. And I think we're failing because we've had a demand from the governor or a request voluntarily to do 20%. Um, we also, by law, are gonna do another 20% by 2020. Um, given that, the numbers that we've seen in the range, except when it rained heavily in December, we're just not meeting those goals at all. So with that, I obviously want you to adopt these and the expansion, but let's look further. Um, what's been mentioned about permanent conservation is an obvious. We should always be looking for the driest day plus fire, and we seem to be on that scale on a long term, so why not plan for that? But I also want to ask what it's going to take. Um, Jay Famagetti's article that came out in the Times that I know you all received essentially says we have over one year of water left. Um, will, will you ration now? And that was directed to the water wholesalers like the Metropolitan Water District, uh, which in April is gonna talk about maybe doing it in July. Without that direction from both you and from the water wholesalers and from the agencies and the cities, they're all gonna wait. And they're waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And without a strong direction, and we'll continue on this path, we're not w doing what we've done in previous droughts. And I've wondered why, and that's the one missing element I've seen. I think we should point to urban examples that have done a good job, both Long Beach, which has done it without raising rates, and Santa Cruz that has done it and has given out fines, but has also allowed water school for those that have failed to do it. Um, but really, again, um, at what point do we accept that this might be just the fourth year of a 10-year drought, and are we ready or prepared for that? And that's, that's our discussion at the Water Dialogue and Met next time. So in many areas, wa outdoor water usage is 70%. Uh, many areas we haven't fulfilled what we can do in conservation, even in Santa Monica, which historically has done a good job, we've really not been meeting our goals, and our pricing for drought allows people to use more water than any of the goals we should be using. So we really have to look at this differently um, so I would say that the state of California casts its um, dry and lonely eyes on you and that um, we really need to stand up and we need to stand behind these, but you need to go to the next step, which means just not percentages, but to actually down get to a per capita like we were talking about the last drought, and that per capita should be 55% residential and 70% others. And those of us that have been to Australia have seen what it took in a long drought to get to that point, but we need to do that now. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. Ms. Poole, did you want to come back up and then uh, dear to Desjardins again? Thanks very much. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Marcus and board members. My name is Kate, my name is Kate Poole. I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council and um, NRDC is here today to strongly support your adoption of, uh, re-adoption of these regulations and expansion with the proposed amendments by staff. We're particularly pleased to see um, the addition of the requirement to notify customers about potential leaks with a lot of the smart metering in technology that's out there now that that information is readily available, but it's often not conveyed to customers. And 
Um, reports have shown that up to 14% per, of indoor water use is lost through leaks, and we can't afford to lose that right now. Um, but as California enters its fourth year of drought, and we all saw the very bleak uh, presentations by Mr. Lehigh and Mr. Milligan today, um, the board could and should do much more, and we urge you to quickly take the next step on emergency regs and, and permanent regulations to deal with demand reductions. In particular, we'd like you to go much further to curb landscaping and lawns demand for drinking water. In particular, the board could and should take a number of steps to reduce water use for ornamental lawns on commercial and institutional properties. Ornamental lawns serve no beneficial use in that context. The untapped potential report that NRDC and the Pacific Institute prepared last year found that we could save more than 900,000 acre feet annually on average if all commercial and institutional landscapes were held to the levels required of new commercial properties under the state's model water efficient um, landscape ordinance. The board could extend the reach of that ordinance to existing properties and save a tremendous amount of water. <clears throat> I'd like to just put that into perspective. This board has heard quite a bit about fish protections and trying to waive those to expand supply in the drought. Deputy Secretary of the Interior Mike Connor recently testified to Congress that fish protections in California in 2014 reduced water supplies by 60,000 acre feet, or 2% of the overall reduction in water supply, compared to the potential to save 900,000 acre feet from just demand reductions on commercial and institutional properties, you can see where we get the biggest bang for our buck. We've uh, put a number of other specific recommendations in our letter to the board following the December workshop, so I won't go through those. Um, but I just would urge you once again to follow up quickly with both, you know, follow up for emergency regulations and permanent demand reduction regulations. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks. Desjardins followed by Lisa Brown. I wanted to thank uh, the board and the staff for what they've done so far. And, uh, but I wanna urge you to go much further um, we have a crisis in urban demand in that it is far outstripping the supply. And to supply this demand, wholesale water agencies are draining their reserves. Uh, an example I put in my letter was Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. In spite of having a 5% allocation last year from the state water project, their customers used 1.88 million acre feet of water. That's 107% of average. Um, to supply this, Metropolitan used 48% of their dry year reserves. They went from 2.3 million acre feet down to 1.2 million acre feet this year. This year, fortunately, they have Colorado River water. It's about 74%, but they can't count on it in coming years. The Colorado River Basin is also subject to drought. Um, I wanted to also say the question is also whether to enact stronger conservation measures this year or have really drastic cuts later. And I want the board to consider the example of Texas that lost 5.6 million shade trees in their drought because they had to curtail all outdoor water use. So my recommendation to the board was to consider curtailing outdoor water use to deep watering every other week. This will keep trees and deep-rooted shrubs alive and it will keep drought-tolerant plants alive. Water thirsty plants and lawns will suffer, um, but it's the only way to conserve supplies and it may be the only way that us, we can conserve the urban supplies to preserve our urban forests next year or the year after. Um, 
So I want, those are my recommendations, and I wanted to thank you. Thank you. Lisa Brown from Roseville, followed by Fiona Sanchez from the Irvine Ranch Water District, if you still want to. Good afternoon, I'll be very, very quick. Um, Roseville was one of those communities that did not implement a uh, restriction on watering days. We allowed seven day a week watering, though we really regulated what our customers used um, more so on water waste. So we managed to achieve a 20% reduction each and every month and a cumulative one throughout the year. So we are one of those agencies that fully support Aqua's recommendations and we were a participant on that subcommittee that would ask for two things. The first would be allowance of a uh, from a 30-day to a 60-day extension, and that's we've already started working on ordinance revisions, but our process is long. Uh, we have a drought management team where we make sure our parks department, our finance department, everybody that needs to be involved in this ordinance modification is at the table, which doesn't happen quickly. It needs to be. Um, uh, a, a good practice so that we can all enforce it and, and regulate it. So that's, we're gonna do our best to meet a 30 day window, but that usually is our, our typical window is about 60 days. So I don't wanna be out of compliance. So I ask for your leniency in that regard. And the other is in regards to Aqua's recommended language. Um, you know, like I said, we're not one of those agencies that have a, has a seven day a week uh, or a, a floor in, instituted now in our ordinance. So we're gonna have to, um, revise our ordinance and it would be helpful to have that clarification in writing that um, we are able in fact to go back and amend our contingency plan um, and if it's outside of the 30 days we do not want to be considered out of compliance so thank you thank you Fiona Sanchez followed by Larry Wolfs from the American lands the California Landscape Contractors Association Hi, good afternoon, Chair Marcus and board members. I'm Fiona Sanchez, I'm the Director of Water Resources for Irvine Ranch Water District. And Irvine Ranch Water District is fully supportive of uh, the board's uh, move to expand and enhance the regulations. Uh, we certainly appreciate the board's continued recognition of the value and role of allocation-based rate structures. Um, I think we've demonstrated that we have been able to achieve a superior level of conservation over the long term through use of that particular rate structure. And it's not the rate structure alone, as you hopefully know. We complement that with a very aggressive conservation program that we implement all the time, which includes leak detection, it includes rebates, it includes outreach to our customers and incentives to them. And in addition, we've also got 25% of our demand is met by uh, recycled water. So we really do an all we can um, to, to reduce demands in our service area. But as you potentially consider longer term um, measures, more permanent measures, we would urge you to consider that that be one of the things you may consider as being part of the options uh, for agencies and maybe providing in some incentives for agencies to consider that as part of a more longer term strategy in, in their meeting their conservation goals. But thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you, you Ms. San Sanchez. Uh, or just a quick question, because uh, I would thought of you in other allocation-based systems when the question of gray water use comes up and, and, and encouraging that. And as you said, you know, you're doing incentive programs, rebates, you know, for uh, efficient appliances and that sort of thing. Have you um, pierced that uh, area of, of gray water or have been talking about it and are formulating any ideas along those lines? We have certainly looked at it, and I think in certain situations in certain communities, it probably does make a lot of sense. For us, we actually are able to fully utilize our wastewater because we have a recycled water plant, which we use actually to meet 25% of our demand. So we already have a way to fully utilize that water. We want that water coming to our treatment plant so we can use it to meet our demands. But we certainly support the use of gray water uh, where, where it makes sense to do so. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. What, one, uh, one question is, uh, I, um, I have heard that uh, Irvine Ranch Water District is um, willing and able to assist others or to talk with others about how they have done their allocation-based rates. 
is that uh, if I heard correctly? You, you have certainly heard correctly. And in fact, you know, we're very open to that. But one of the things that we actually are, are in the process of doing right now is that we have partnered with other agencies that also have allocation-based rate structures. And we are putting together, a, a, we're calling it a how-to guide for how to implement this type of rate structure. So agencies that might be interested, maybe they are, they think there are a lot of barriers to implement, we can kind of say, here's how we did it, how you overcome that or maybe they're not as significant as you might have thought. So we're putting that together with a goal of having it available um, a little later this year, maybe late summer. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I sort of have it, you sort of have the top three agencies you want everybody to go <laughs> see. Um, Mr. Rolls. Um, there you are. Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Larry Rolfus. I'm with the California Landscape Contractors Association. And we are a trade association of about 2,000 state licensed landscape contractors and some of their suppliers and um, um, several um, uh, landscape professionals as well. Um, our leadership uh, asked me uh, to convey the association's support for uh, readopting and expanding the emergency um, drought regulations for urban water conservation. Um, given that virtually the entire state is experiencing uh, s severe to exceptional um, drought conditions, it seems uh, appropriate to extend the current regulations. Uh, that's, that seems clear, uh, given that California has apparently uh, fallen short of the 20% goal, it seems appropriate to uh, send uh, a stronger message for the coming months. The prohibition of um, landscape irrigation during and 48 um, hours after uh, measurable uh, precipitation addresses an all too common sight on rainy days, one that is extremely distressing to professional professionals in the landscape industry, as well as to anyone who's conscientious about trying to save water. And we think this prohibition will um, encourage the public to have a conversation uh, about the practice, and, and, and it, it will, will, will cause uh, people to uh, um, more often make a connection between the weather and the, the, the water requirements of their plants. Um, we also like the recommendation uh, because it gives property owners several compliance options. They can get a rain sensor, they can get many uh, weather-based controllers, or if they don't want to go that route, they can manually shut off their controller or use the, uh, the rain delay option uh, when necessary. Uh, we do have a few questions, though, uh, uh, about how this prohibition will be enforced. Um, for example, many of the uh, rain sensors that are in common use in residences uh, would not shut off the irrigation system for 48 hours. It would be more like 24 hours. Um, there are also situations where using rain sensor or weather-based controller technology, it might not always shut off the, the irrigation system during the beginning of a precipitation event. And then for, for owners who um, you know, don't want to go the, uh, the rain sensor route, they might forget to um, turn off their controllers or they, they might be on vacation or uh, at work or, or asleep if it rains at night. Um, and the, the uh, you know, when is um, precipitation, dri dr when is precipitation drizzle and um, when is it rainfall that, that will get to the, the, the plant root zones? I think we think everyone should be clear about where that dividing line is. And our members uh, suggested that um, at a minimum the, the regulation define uh, what is meant by measurable precipitation. And uh, they thought that, um, that well, it, it, uh, the, I mean, you could make an argument that it should be one eighth of an inch. Uh, that would be enough for most of the better rain sensors to measure it. Uh, and also that would, it would be enough for the water to go to be used in the 
by the plants to, to go to the root zones. Um, but then they thought that a quarter of an inch would allow for uh, room for error. Um, another option would be to instead uh, forbid instances of repeated or flagrant irrigation um, during measurable precipitation. And this would allow some room for mistakes by uh, the property owner or accidentally uh, crossing that uh, measurable line. Um, following up on what um, I think it was Max said um, earlier that really what you want to do is uh, 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 you, you, what you're after is an exercise in sound judgment, I think you said. Um, following up on that, may, maybe the solution is to go the opposite direction and instead of using um, the word precipitation, how about rainfall? Um, to, you know, you know, not mist, not drizzle, rainfall, or rainfall, snow, and sleet, or whatever. But um, um, anyway, uh, the, um, if you don't like any of my suggestions, um, and you leave the wording as it is, uh, we hope that water agencies and local governments will uh, be flexible about um, in, in enforcing the regulation and provide warnings and education uh, before resorting to fines. Um, we also support the two-day um, limitation on um, two-day limitation on irrigation uh, per week. Um, uh, we're not really enthused about that. Uh, mind you, that most uh, landscape professionals believe that the best way to conserve water is to do water budgeting combined with a, a really good allocation-based rate structure, preferably a, 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 a rate structure that is based on uh, plant water requirements. Um, essentially, what we like is to, to eliminate w waste, which we define as, as water in excess of uh, the plant water requirements. However, we recognize um, that that, as, uh, that the two-day uh, limit, in Dave Boland's words, is kind of a backstop. Um, we, we also realize that uh, you know, drastic and hopefully temporary measures may be necessary in a severe drought emergencies, so, in emergency, so um, we understand that. In conclusion, um, we know, and, and I hope you recognize, that uh, landscapes are essential to the, the quality of life in our urban communities. Um, we certainly recognize that um, with, with, the, with the, the current drought emergency, it's imperative to uh, make sure that our landscapes are using as little water as possible. So thank you. Thank you very much. All good <coughs> suggestions. Some of it may be the perfect is the enemy of the good there, but we don't disagree with you on a lot of that. The question is what we can do right now, but longer term, we definitely want to continue working with you. Thank you. Always thoughtful. All right, that is the end of our comments. We have a couple of um, things to uh, resolve. There's certainly some follow-up to um, work with some of the speakers on the longer-term issues. A question for staff were two. One is, I, I think we ought to add in the clarifying language if that helps some people, because it doesn't hurt anything. Um, I hope people don't mind, but I'll look to my colleagues on the 60 days, I mean, there is an argument that people want to be in compliance with something and they want to have a public discussion. Um, am I impatient? I am impatient on this. Impatient comments from earlier, I, I would defer to all of you if you want to make it 60 rather than 30. I'm also fine with making it 30 and using enforcement discretion, but again, I know people want to be in compliance if they can. I just don't want them to dawdle. I, I will say that I am sorry we have to do this at all. I think it's unusual that we're the only state that's ever done statewide conservation regulations precisely because urban agencies did not step up as much as they should be stepping up considering the pain that's happening in the rest of the state, whether to rural communities or agriculture, um, which is severe, but also, in many cases, um, but also the risk to their own uh, futures and uh, having to take more significant effort. There have been some great success stories, there have been some heroic efforts that people have taken, but we are not seeing the level of stepping up and ringing the alarm bells that the situation really warrants in many cases. So I'm tolling down. So I'll defer to you all on that question. And anything else you wanna say? Any comment? And then just for those of you, many of you here for the next two issues, we do have to take a lunch break. Um, it's. Uh, 
We have to. Um, and we're going to take at least a half hour, if not 45 minutes. Um, it just, uh, we, you want us alert and uh, our sugar levels correct before we go to the next two intellectually challenging issues. So just in case you wanted to leave and get a longer lunch break, you could. Colleagues, anything? You, you had uh, the language up on the screen just then? Yeah, we can put the language back up on the screen. I, I would just note um, in response to uh, Mr. Rolfe's comments uh, that w we did use the word measurable rainfall in the current language uh, there. Interestingly, I <laughs> I thought 45 days was actually a good number, but uh, because with the addition of uh, of this going to OAL, uh, I think that's plenty of time. But uh, 30 30 days, we, we can check it, and I, we would use discretion. But I do know some agencies will be quite nervous about achieving that. So I'm fine with. I'm, f I'm fine, 45 would be my recommendation, but I'm fine with whatever the board decides. Uh, let me, let me uh, throw in my two cents and say that I would prefer 45 in that I think it's important for us to, to say what we mean and mean what we say. I mean, I appreciate that we have enforcement discretion, but going into this, I don't want to send the message that, oh, you know, this is what we adopted, but we'll use our ex you know, enforcement right. discretion. So I'm more comfortable with 45. All right, do I have a motion? Yeah, I, or well, I, I would like to make a motion, but I'd also like to make some comments and maybe uh, have a discussion about next steps. Um, this is just so obvious. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's another round of common sense and we need to uh, move forward. So I'd like to make a motion um, that we adopt um, with the 45 day um, uh, change. I think that it'd be important for us to also talk about next steps, um, planning for the future to uh, make th this um, package permanent, and then also what steps should we take as we uh, want to go forward and look at uh, the many suggestions that are out there. And I think that the struggle that we face is that we're trying to keep it very simple. And in the name of keeping it simple, we have to keep it basic, but there are a lot of really good ideas out there. And I just get the sense that every board meeting when we receive um, the very good presentations from staff um, uh, about implementation of the current reg and um, uh, sort of the challenges with how we look at the numbers, we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to have a broader dialogue. And there are so many different pieces. Uh, what more could we do on reporting? What more on enforcement and compliance? What more on demand reduction? Uh, there's a lot of good ideas on that. Uh, leaks, yep. uh, incentives, incentives for allocation-based rates, uh, smart software, rebates. There's a whole package of ideas on incentives. And then uh, maybe targeted review for areas that just consistently don't seem to make the mark. Not that we want to do public shaming, but when you come out with those lists and a community is at the, uh, uh, the, the top of the list in terms of water use, um, we have seen that those communities respond. So, um, you know, creative ideas um, for us just in um, uh, having a, a targeted review in those areas. And so I would just like to have us talk about how we may want to go forward um, on these, the, the next step beyond the low-hanging fruit. And what strikes me is just um, when we receive the reports from staff, uh, perhaps if as part of those reports or maybe even just a separate item, that we could just take these on one by one, have a discussion about leaks, just take a day or a, a, a board uh, item and just talk about leaks and maybe another uh, time uh, talk about incentives. There's a lot of things that we can do, uh, uh, but there's probably more that we can't do um, and that takes time to walk through uh, the uh, the various uh, roles of other agencies and what can be done in these in these uh, in these areas. Well, how about this as a suggestion? It is uh, we have the February seventeenth. We had sort of the basic outline of what we heard from folks, but I think I I think you're right. I think it would be good to maybe not do one a day because it'll take forever, but to tee up a workshop of our own 
to narrow those issues and be able to just have the conversation about mm -hmm. it before staff formulates the next level. We're, so we're not having the conversation in the context of just an adoption. I think that's right. a good idea. Sounds good. Okay. Yep. And I want to add commercial institutional yeah, uh, to our list yeah. of discussion right. items. Right. And we'll need to work with our colleagues at DWR and others, as you said, and the other agencies' use of recycled water, if it's available, we have to define what that means, things like that. Uh, I would, I'll second Board Member Diodamo's uh, motion as well as second her suggestion that we have a follow-up discussion. Uh, actually, I think a full item might be a good idea of some of the, the topics uh, she mentioned in terms of going forward on both additional interim regulations as well as the permanent one. Yeah. And spend a lot, give ourselves a lot of time to do Yes. That. So can I just okay. want to uh, cl clarify, um, uh, Board Member Diodama, are you moving to adopt with, with the change to 45 days? Okay. And, and the language that you have here. Yeah. That you're on there. Um, so I want to second this idea of, of um, you know, the, sorry. I'm sorry, not third thing. But anyway, echo this idea of the discussion. But just point out a couple things that now with the new reporting that's required for compliance and enforcement, we'll have more information to go through. Okay. And that can feed into the topics that Board Member Diadama was bringing up, which are all relevant. You know, in terms of leak detection, that sh we should get a lot more information through that reporting. I'm expecting that. And then um, also, through these monthly updates, we've been talking about these issues at great length and in detail, actually. I'm gonna give ourselves some credit. And one of the issues I wanna give ourselves some credit for that came out of the December workshop in Los Angeles was we were recognizing the importance of a performance standard uh, and that we have some that we can draw from, the 55 gallon per day per person for indoor use. It's on the books but it's not in this regulation. And a lot of the concern about relative reporting and, and, and you know how are we doing comparing to last year, not really telling the whole story, whether you're on the conservation side or the water retail side of that question, it comes down to what should be expected of Californians for water use. What is the standard? And Australia took us there, you know, took people there. Brisbane had a 35, Gallon. It was in liters, I forget the conversion. That's right. <laughs> but it is 35 gallons. It was about 35. Right. You know, and, and really, let's, let's be clear. With this drought that we're facing down this year, no Californian should be using more than 55 gallons per day per person indoor. And so why, why can't that be part of a, a permanent discussion? and harden the urban side of the demand equation in our state. So I just want to kind of put a little emphasis that we should be looking at performance standards, taking into account discussions earlier about importance of regional considerations and, and what should be expected in outdoor use. But this is a serious drought. We need to face it down together and, and look at these issues very seriously. Thanks. Good, thank you. Isn't there also a change sheet in addition to the change that is made here? Yes. Yeah, there is. A, there, there are just a couple of wording changes, and I'm not sure if they're up on what, what we've put up on the screen. Uh, but we, they we, are. Yeah, they should be, be up there so that you can see what, what's on the change sheet. Yeah. And the only item before the board moves to a vote, because it sounds like the discussion is over, is I just want to clarify that this is a motion to adopt the, the staff resolution with the change sheet and then with amendments proposed by board member Diadamo uh, to the attachment, which is the actual text of the regulation. And it includes the aqua language that was up on the board a moment ago, amending section 865 subdivision B1. And as you heard from uh, Mr. Rose earlier, really that language just provide some additional clarification about the interplay between subdivisions B1 and subdivision C. And then there will be uh, two additional edits by my count um, to have it reflect 45 days. One will be up there in subdivision B1 as shown. The 30 days at the end of the red sentence will be deleted and replaced with 45. And then there will be conforming changes in subdivision C and subdivision E to replace the 30 days with 45 days. And I believe that's the entire motion. Are there any days? counts that I've missed in there, Max, or?
Okay. Is that okay? Didi so, Didi so moves. <laughs> <laughs> Pam so second. She's so third. Yeah. All in we favor. need food. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, Carrie, thank you all for the discussion. We will be back as close to 2.30 as we can.